The Semitic Languages, a brief introduction. Salam and welcome and thanks for tuning in. Um, this is the first video of my rebooted channel. Uh, I've been making this, uh, I've been making videos for my ancient Semitic channel since 2013 and then at some point I stopped in 2016 and now I've been planning for a while to uh, make something like, uh, maybe you could call it the second season uh, of my videos. And yeah, so the main point of my videos will still be uh, reading text just for the purpose of, um, I just want to present the, the pronunciation of ancient Semitic languages and the way they could have sounded, they could have been pronounced because that is something that I've studied and that I'm passionate about. And I saw that there's a lot of free educational content on YouTube, which I found very inspirational. Like sometimes you will find whole um, language classes or courses on YouTube for free. Um, you also find a lot of garbage on YouTube. So I thought I might weigh in on the other side and present some of the um, some of the things that I've learned over the years. Um, I've been studying linguistics and Semitics since 2009. Um, I've stopped for a while after my master's graduation and just worked as a language teacher. And now I'm back, back in school and doing my PhD in Semitic linguistics. So yeah, that is some background. <clears throat> and as before, on this channel, I want to present to you Semitic texts like texts in Akkadian, Syriac, Sabaic, etc., and read them to you. But um, other than before, this time I want to give you some background. Like I want to explain um, why I pronounce a certain language the way I pronounce it, and give you some maybe maybe like a give you like guides how to read uh, Syriac, how to read epigraphic South Arabian, etc. And also some introductory videos. So this will be the first one, just a very general introduction to Semitic languages, like what are Semitic languages. And uh, yeah, then the, the next videos will be uh, looking at specific Semitic languages and reading them. Okay, so this is the first video, the Semitic languages, a brief introduction. So what are Semitic languages? Semitic languages are a language family, just like Indo-European or Uralic or Niger-Congo, etc. That means um, the languages that are in this group have probably have a common origin and there are significant similarities in phonology, which means the way these languages are pronounced, the, the sound inventories and the way the sounds interact with each other. Morphology, which means the way words are formed Syntax, that is uh, the way sentences or larger units of speech are arranged, and of course lexicon. And these similarities, you see I wrote, uh, I wrote significant similarities, so not just random um, similarities, but systematic, significant, and basic similarities in these different kinds of speech. Because in general, similarities between two or more languages do not necessarily hint at a genetic relationship but can be a product of contact. You might want to look up the word Sprachbund for this or aerial diffusion, etc. So um, languages that are in contact, whether they're uh, spoken in adjacent areas or they have some other kind of contact through trade or religion, politics or anything else, uh, can borrow words or even grammatical elements from one language to the other, vice versa. So if you want to assess whether two languages are actually genetically in a relationship, which means they have a common origin, you need to look for significant systematic basic similarities. And we find a lot of these in the different Semitic languages. So if we look at a word map of the language families, we see a lot of bright colors here and Two languages that are within one area of the same color are thought to be genetically related. So like for example about here we have German and German is in that light green area which is Indo-European. That means German is related to English which is here and I mean also in the in the US and Canada like this and German and English are also related to Spanish which is here and in South America 
and also to languages like uh, say Persian, which is spoken I think that area approximately. Okay, so all of these different colors are genetic language families, like light green is Indo-European, um, light yellow is Afro-Asiatic, of which Semitic is a part, and dark green, for example here, Hungarian, Estonian, Finnish, etc., is Uralic, etc., etc. So those are language families that all have common origins. Now, who discovered, um, in quotes, the Semitic languages? They weren't, of course, discovered because they were simply there, but um, at some point, people started noticing uh, similarities, especially um, people who are bilingual. Uh, so if we're talking about Semitic languages, there were, for example, Jewish grammarians during the um, late antiquity and early middle ages, who, for example, were bilingual in Hebrew and Aramaic, or Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic. So Hebrew is the sacred language, Aramaic is some kind of second sacred language, and Arabic is their everyday language. And of course, um, people who knew these three languages noticed that there were uh, systematic uh, similarities in phonology, morphology, syntax, and lexicon. And there's also a case of uh, Jewish grammarians like Yehuda ben Quraysh, who lived in northwest Africa, and he also knew Tamazight, a Berber language, and he also noticed similarities between Hebrew, Aramaic, Aramaic, Arabic, and Tamazight, or Berber. So he was maybe like one of the first scholars um, who discovered the similarities between Afro-Asiatic families. Okay, I will talk about Afro-Asiatic in detail in my second video, so don't worry about that. This video is more focused on the Semitic branch of the Afro-Asiatic phylum. So in the 18th and 19th century, there was a, like a um, fashion, you could say, or a tendency among European scholars to um, name and categorize and, uh, and catalog everything from languages to, um, to the subject of biology and uh, geology and stars so scholars back then wanted to bring order to the universe by naming and grouping things so this was also a tendency in, in the in the area of linguistics uh, european scholars started systematically um systematically like uh, studying uh, languages and and their relationships and naming language families so european scholars mostly knew Latin and Greek, and also uh, started learning Sanskrit. They noted the, the similarities and came up with names. So that language family uh, was called Indo-European or Indo-Germanic, and they came up with names for other language families like Dravidian, uh, Finno-Ugric, etc., etc. Um, yeah. So these language families sometimes they were named after individual languages like Finno-Ugric after Finnish and the Ugric branch, which includes Hungarian, or geographic areas like Indo-European, Indian subcontinent, and Europe. And sometimes they were named after ethnic groups and other things, etc., etc. So who came up with the name Semitic? Uh, there was a German philologist, August Ludwig von Schlötzer, and he simply named Semitic languages, or um, the, the language family he had in mind for Hebrew, Arabic, etc. He simply named it after the uh, Old Testament um, ancestor of the of the Israelites, Arameans, Arabs, etc., who is Shem in the Old Testament in Hebrew. So um, just to make clear, why why isn't it then called Shemitic but Semitic? Well, Schlutzer was German, and German Bible translations heavily relied on the Greek translations. Greek doesn't have a letter for the sh sound, so in the Greek translation, like the Septuagint, shem was rendered as sem. Hence, in the German Bible translations, sem, and he called that language family semitish, which was then borrowed to English as Semitic, not Shemitic. Yeah, so um, you see the uh, pedigree. So here we have shem, ham, and Yopheth, three sons of Noah, and then shem beget. Elam, Ashur, etc., and they beget the ancestors of the um, Hebrew-speaking people, or Israelites and Arabs, 
Arameans, etc. Actually, here we have Aram, whom the uh, Arameans are named after, or probably the other way around. Yeah, so this is where the name Semitic comes from. But does this mean that um, biblical or Old Testament genealogy actually still plays a role in the um, um, in the categorization or the subdivision of language families? No. See the next slide. So um, one thing to keep in mind, the name Semitic in linguistics, uh, today Old Testament genealogy is irrelevant for linguistics. Um, it might even be misleading. Like, for example, if you look at the Old Testament, uh, you have Canaan or Canaan, who is the son of Ham, not of Shem. Um, of course, the Israelites who wrote the, the Torah or the Old Testament try to distance themselves from the uh, polytheist Canaanites, they themselves being monotheists and following the one true God in their eyes. Um, so they came up with this genealogy to, um, yeah, to put a, like a border between themselves and the uh, Canaanites. But linguistically, um, the Canaanites spoke Canaanite, which is a Semitic language without doubt. And actually, Hebrew is a dialect of Canaanite. So if we look at a actual linguistic tree of a sub-branch of the Semitic languages, Northwest Semitic. So here you see Northwest Semitic, which is a part of Semitic sub-branch. And it has three subdivisions, Canaanite, Aramaic, and Ugaritic. Canaanite, so the languages spoken approximately in the area that was called Canaan, or it still is. And well, of Canaanite, we have several dialects that are um, that are attested in written form and inscriptions and other documents, etc. So one is Phoenician, the language of the Phoenician cities, including Punic, which was spoken in North Africa, like Carthage, etc. But also Hebrew, it's also a dialect of Canaanite, and also Moabite of the of the uh, state of Moab. Actually, Moabite only consists of one single inscription, the Mesha, Mesha text, Mesha inscription, and also Ammonite and Edomite. So all of these are called Canaanite because these are the uh, dialects of which we have um, written accounts in Canaan. And this, um, sub, the subdivisions or the this kind of uh, taxonomy is purely based on the way these languages look, on their differences and similarities. So Old Testament mythology does not play any role in it. We just keep the name Semitic because it is a name <clears throat> and it is useful. See the next slide for this. So um, one general remark on the uh, naming of languages and language families. Always keep in mind that names are just conventions. Um, Semitic doesn't actually mean that Semiticists or linguists believe that other people speaking Semitic languages go back to a mythological ancestor called Shem. No, that's not the that's not what this is about. So names are just convention and they're just there to um, to identify languages. Okay, so there's no real need to change the name Semitic. And though there have been proposals, like one proposal was to rename the language family to a Syro Arabian, but it simply um, it, it wasn't accepted. Linguists just kept using the name Semitic. Um, I mean, the name is useful if, I, if we change the names of languages or language families over and over again. Um, it'll be confusing if you want to look for a language in an older publication or something like that, or in an older book. Okay, so we keep that name. There was one successful name change, though, which was Hemido-Semitic, which is now called Afro-Asiatic. Um, the, the, the most, um, let's say, the, uh, yeah, the, the main reason was that uh, Hemido-Semitic suggested the, uh, and this was actually um, believed, and suggested that this language family consists of two branches, like Semitic, which contained Arabic, Hebrew, etc., and then Hamitic, which was um, supposed to contain ancient Egyptian, uh, Somali, Hausa, Tamazight, etc. But um, after a while, it became clear that this Hamitic branch of Hamitic wasn't justified because um, Egyptian and Hausa and Somali weren't more similar to each other than they were to Semitic. So 
think it was Joseph Greenberg who coined the term Afroasiatic, which is more neutral. Um, Afroasiatic makes sense because that language family has been spoken in Africa and Asia since ancient times, and it does not suggest um, a certain subgrouping of, of the uh, of the subdivisions. Okay, so this is one example uh, why language changes are sometimes uh, sometimes they make sense, and then they are also usually successful. <clears throat> so, what are the earliest written accounts of Semitic languages? The oldest two Semitic languages, judging by written accounts, are Akkadian and Eblite. Both are attested since the 25th century BCE. Um, Akkadian became extinct in the 6th century BCE, but remained in literary use until the 2nd century CE, so mostly as a literary language in Mesopotamia. Whereas Eblite became extinct, or at least the uh, written account stopped in the 22nd century BCE. I think it was mostly replaced by Akkadian. Next is Ugoritic, 14th until 12th century BCE. Um, then Ugarit was sacked and the written account stopped. And Ugaritic is probably just a dialect of Amorite. Um, so far, I don't think there's any uh, real uh, literal tradition or any real written accounts of Amorite. There are Amorite names mentioned in Akkadian that are the oldest attestations of Amorite. But Ugaritic simply seems to be the only written form of Amorite that we have now. Maybe there will be more discovered in the future, but who knows. Um, then we have Phoenician since the uh, 12th century BCE until the 6th, with, uh, which refers to Punic in North Africa. Uh, Phoenician proper in the Levant, mostly what is today Lebanon, became extinct a couple of centuries earlier. But until the 6th century CE, common era, we have Punic in North Africa, which is a variant of Phoenician. Then we have Aramaic since the 10th century BCE until today which makes it the oldest known Semitic language still spoken today. And Hebrew also since the uh, 10th century BCE, but Hebrew became kind of extinct for a couple of centuries. Um, it wasn't used as a spoken language for a while. It was a purely literal language between the 5th and 19th century CE. And then it was successfully revived as a spoken language today. It is the official language of the state of Israel. And I think um, looking at languages worldwide, Hebrew is really the, the most successful example for a revived language that was not used as a spoken language for, for a longer time. Okay, so these are the oldest. And of course, later there were many more Semitic languages that appeared um, in, in a written form at some point of time. So how many people speak Semitic languages today? Um, as for Arabic, which is by far the largest Semitic languages concerning number of speakers, um, the estimates vary quite significantly, but um, they all center around maybe 350 million speakers, including all varieties of Arabic from Morocco to Iraq and Yemen and also Sudan. So 350. Uh, native speakers of Arabic varieties today. Second is Amharic in Ethiopia, 22 million. Tigrinya in northern Ethiopia and Eritrea, 7 million. Modern Hebrew, this, the uh, revived language with 5 million speakers, mostly in Israel. And then there is a whole number of other modern Semitic languages that don't all fit on this single slide. There's Guragi languages in southern Ethiopia, Tigri in Eritrea modern Aramaic languages, there's Maltese on the island of Malta, which historically is an Arabic dialect. There's a couple of modern South Arabian languages, etc., etc., etc. The total number of Semitic languages, well, the number is not really reliable. Um, there's a great um, variation, but approximately maybe more than 400 million speakers worldwide. And if we look at a map, so Everything that is green here is the areas where Semitic languages are spoken, and most of it is Arabic. So stretching from from those um, tiny spots in in Iran, where we have um, small like enclaves of Arabic speakers, up to these parts of Western Africa, Mauritania, etc., where we have Hassaniya dialects of Arabic, and here we have Maltese on the island of Malta, of course Hebrew in Israel some Aramaic languages in this area, 
modern South Arabian, um, the south of the Arabian Peninsula, mostly Oman, also Yemen, and here in Eritrea and Ethiopia, we have uh, Ethiosemitic languages like Tigri, Tigrinya, Amharic, Guragi, Harari, and many more that do not fit on this map. So just an overview, uh, yeah, what, 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 is, um, what are the different Semitic languages and the different subgroups? So we have East Semitic. East Semitic um, is a relatively small group and highly divergent from the rest of Semitic. East Semitic consists of Akkadian, with its two dialects, Babylonian and Assyrian, and then also historical stages like uh, Old Assyrian, Middle Assyrian, Neo Assyrian, etc., and also Ablite, which was also and which was only used as a written language for a few centuries and is very hard to read, which is why I've never had a video on Ablite on my channel because it is quite obscure. And here we have a picture of a cuneiform tablet with an Akkadian text, which is the, the main form uh, in which Akkadian was written. Then we have Northwest Semitic languages. Mostly they're divided into four branches. One is Ugaritic, or actually um, maybe it's just a dialect of Amorite. Okay, I mentioned this before. Here we see a clay tablet with the Ugaritic alphabet, like a writing exercise of a student or something. Then we have Samalian, a single language with, which seems to have been pretty similar to Aramaic, and then two other sub-branches of Northwest Semitic, which is Aramaic and Canaanite, and we can look at these in detail. So um, Aramaic is usually divided into historic stages, like the oldest stage, epigraphic Old Aramaic, then we have official or imperial Aramaic, an official language in the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Then at some point, Middle Aramaic emerges with uh, several dialects like Palestinian, Nabataean, Palmarine, and Hetran. And here we see a papyrus from the Egyptian city of Elephantine, which had a um, Aramaic-speaking garrison, so Aramaic-speaking troops during the, uh, the the Persian era in Egypt, and um, like the uh, the final historic stage of Aramaic is late or modern Aramaic. So these languages, some of these were spoken or written in the in the early Middle Ages, like uh, maybe third century from then on, and some of those uh, survived till the modern age. And there's like three branches of this late or modern Western Aramaic, uh, late or modern Aramaic, and the three branches are Western, Central, and Eastern Aramaic. So um, late Western Aramaic is Jewish, Galilean, Samaritan, Christian, Palestinian, and modern Western Aramaic, which is the only language of that branch surviving until the present day. Modern Western Aramaic is spoken in a Syrian town called Ma'alula, and two neighboring villages, Baha and Jubadin. Then there's also late Central Aramaic uh, with two languages called Turoyo and Mlahso that are still spoken today in the uh, south or southeast of Turkey. Uh, for example, in the uh, Turoyo spoken in the area of Tur Abdin, so uh, Mountain of the Servants, Mountain of the Servants of God. And there's also late Eastern Aramaic, Syriac, very important, um, literary language, Jewish Babylonian Aramaic, Mandaic, and Northeastern Neo-Aramaic, also known as Nina, both of which are still spoken today. Uh, Northeastern Neo-Aramaic is sometimes called uh, Assyrian or uh, Athuroyo, etc. by its speakers, but mostly in Semitic linguistics one calls it Northeastern Neo-Aramaic. And you can see a book here. Malkunos Oro, which is the little prince, which has been translated into modern Aramaic. I think it's in Toroyo, and you can see you can order this on Amazon. And the, the, the interesting thing is it is it is monolingual, so it is only in Aramaic, but it has um, it has two scripts. So if you open it from the right side, it looks like this, and it's written in the Syriac script. But you can also open the book from the other side, and there you find the same story in the same language, but written in the Latin alphabet. So I I had it in my hands once, 
uh, in the library of one of my past universities. So besides Aramaic, Northwest Semitic also contains Canaanite, and yeah, like I said before, that contains Phoenician and Punic, Hebrew, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, and also Deir Allah. And here we have a inscription on a bronze tablet, or is it gold? I think it's bronze, um, in Phoenician. So one other group of Semitic languages is Arabic which of course contains classical Arabic and also its modern variety, modern standard Arabic, but also the many, many, many Arabic varieties. Um, Arabic varieties are grouped into Maghrebi, which means Northwestern African, Egyptian Sudanese, Levantine, Mesopotamian, and Peninsular, but all of these dialect groups contain many different sub-dialects. And there's also Maltese, which historically uh, should be counted as Maghrebi, but um, if we look at it as it is today, so from a synchronic perspective, it kind of is its own language for several reasons. So I will talk about Maltese in my Arabic video. And here we see an old uh, Quran manuscript in classical Arabic. So we also have uh, ancient North Arabian which I put in quotes because ancient North Arabian is actually kind of an umbrella term for a group of languages that are not necessarily closely related. Um, ancient North Arabian is actually a term for a number of languages that you that are using the same script. So the script is the one that is the um, the aspect of these languages that um, uh, by which they are grouped, but not necessarily by similarity of the languages themselves or by a genetic relationship because um, if we look at these different ancient North Arabian, so-called ancient North Arabian varieties, we can see that, for example, two of them called Sephaitic and Hismaic are probably just Arabic. So they, they seem to be uh, just Arabic dialects written in this script instead of the Arabic script. But if we look at Timonitic, for example, we will see that it is very close to Northwest Semitic, probably a variety of Northwest Semitic that just happened to be written in this ancient North Arabian script. And I mean, this is like, like the scripts of many Semitic languages, like many of these abjads. It does not write vowels and different Semitic languages without the vowels can look quite similar, especially if the material is scarce, like in this case. And then there's also um, other varieties have been identified like Duma Edic, Dadan Edic, Hesse Edic, Thamudic B, C, D, and F. There's no A and E because they were renamed. I think Thamudic A was renamed to Hismaic, and one of the other ones was called Thamudic E before. And those, again, the material is very scarce, and those haven't been successfully identified as being a member of any other branch of Semitic. So they are Semitic without any doubt, but so far it's impossible to say whether those are dialects of Arabic or close to Arabic or maybe related to Northwest Semitic or any other Semitic idiom or forming their own branches of Semitic. So keep in mind ancient North Arabian is an umbrella term for a couple of different languages using the same script. Okay, so so much for ancient North Arabian and mostly it looks like on this picture these are petroglyphs of one of those. I think it's Hismaic, and you can see this in Jordan and Wadi Ram at the uh, at the Lawrence Spring. I've been there, so yeah, I've been in touch with this script. We've also got epigraphic South Arabian. This is actually uh, more closer to an actual genetic subgroup of Semitic, though. Um, also, epigraphic South Arabian, when the term was coined, uh, it was mostly done on the ground of um, the uh, geographical area, the writing system or script, and on cultural reasons. But if we look at those languages more closely, we see that uh, Sabaic is quite divergent from the other three, from Minaic, Katabanic, and Hadramitic. So they are all named after ancient kingdoms, Saba, Ma'in, Kataban, and Hadramaut. Yeah, so uh, Sabaic seems to be quite different. It seems like Sabaic is closer to Central Semitic, which means Arabic 
and Northwest Semitic and maybe Aramaic. There's some uh, striking similarities between Sabaic and Aramaic, whereas Minnaic, Kedabanic, and Hadramitic are closer to South Semitic, like Ethio Semitic or modern South Arabian. Okay, so I will talk about this also in detail in my upcoming video on Epigraphic South Arabian. And the next group we have here is modern South Arabian, not ancient or old or epigraphic, but modern South Arabian. Like epigraphic South Arabian, pay attention to the name. It's not Arabic, but Arabian, which means this is not a variety of Arabic, but a language or a group of languages that are spoken on the Arabian Peninsula. Peninsula, sorry. Hence, <clears throat> they're named Arabian. Okay, so these are Semitic languages, not closely related to Arabic, but Semitic. And um, yeah, these are modern, which means they're still spoken today, actually. We don't have any uh, written evidence of uh, modern South Arabian in the past. And even up to the present day, those languages haven't uh, developed a written tradition that we know of. So they're purely oral. The people speaking this langu these languages are usually using Arabic as their uh, written medium of communication, which is also why I could not provide a picture of written modern South Arabian. I mean, there are notes and grammar books and field notes of linguists, but it's it's not an it's not an actual written tradition of the language. So yeah, I just posted a screenshot of this nice YouTube video, a short conversation in the Harsusi language with a father and a son sitting in the desert uh, and talking in their native language. Yeah, so Eastern South Arabian is uh, subdivided into two groups, Eastern and Western. So Eastern modern South Arabian consists of two languages. One is called Jibali or Shari. Actually, Shari is the uh, the endonym or the native name. And also Sokotri, spoken on the island of Socotra. And then we have four Western languages, Mehri, which is, I think, the only one of those languages that is spoken in Yemen. The others are spoken in Oman. And also the island of Socotra is part of Yemen. But um, all of the others that are spoken on the mainland are spoken in Oman, except for Mehri. And then we have Harsusi, Badhari, and Hobiot. So modern South Arabian, very interesting group of languages and probably offers some job opportunities for linguists because I, I can imagine there's field work to be done. And next and finally, so the final group I'm going to talk about in the final group of Semitic languages is Ethio-Semitic. And those languages are spoken in what is today Ethiopia and Eritrea, actually named after, after what was called Ethiopia in, in antiquity, which had a different geographical area than today's Ethiopia. So as I said, today they're mostly spoken in modern Ethiopia and Eritrea. And first we have a we have a northern branch. Um, actually, the unity of this northern branch is, is discussed in linguistics or in Semitics. So these three languages might not be a genetic subgroup, but mostly still for just for practical reasons, they're grouped as North Ethiosemitic. So there's Old Ethiopic, which is also called Giz, with its ancient, uh, with the, the, sorry, with its uh, native name. And on the right side here, we see a Giz manuscript. Giz had, has its own writing system. And we also have Tigri, which is spoken in, in uh, Eritrea, and Tigrinya, which is spoken in Eritrea and also the Tigray province of northern Ethiopia, which has been in the news for the last uh, for the last year. Um, yeah, besides these three languages, we also have something called South Ethiosemitic, which is a little more complex. See the next slide. So South Ethiosemitic, um, all of these are spoken in Ethiopia. We have the Amharic Argoba group. Um, which basically consists of two languages, Amharic, second most spoken language in Ethiopia after the Cushitic language, Oromo, and it has been the uh, official language of Ethiopia for a long time, and Argoba, which I think is almost extinct. Then we have Harari, spoken in the Ethiopian city of Harar. Then we have the group of East Guragi languages, 
and we have something which is called Outer South Ethiosemitic. The others, the remaining languages, are sometimes grouped as Transversal South Ethiosemitic, but Outer South Ethiosemitic consists of a couple of languages like Gafet Kistani Muhar and the West Gurage languages, which in turn is a group of languages with uh, many different varieties. So also this, especially Guragi, uh, there's a lot of different languages in a very limited geographical area. And I can imagine this still offers quite a couple of opportunities for um, Semitic linguists um, interested in doing field work, for example. So let me talk about some of the um, common common features, the basic features that Semitic languages have in common. We start with phonology, talking about sounds of the languages, consonants and vowels. And one feature, one prominent feature of Semitic languages are the so-called pharyngeal consonants. Pharyngeal means they are pronounced in the pharynx, pharynx, which is the throat. So for example, we have this uh, pharyngeal H or pharyngeal uh, voiceless fricative, which is pronounced ha. So like an H sound that comes from the very back of your throat, ha. And this exists in many Semitic languages, like in Arabic, it is represented by the letter ha. In Hebrew, by, well, in modern Hebrew and in many traditions, it's pronounced chet, but in, in original Masoretic and also Proto-Hebrew or um, or Paleo-Hebrew, it was pronounced heith, so also from the back of the throat. Actually, uh, some pronunciation traditions of Hebrew, for example, that of Yemeni Jews, uh, still pronounces it that way, so heith. Same in Syriac, heith. Then we have the letter ha in Giz, and we have the letter, I think it's called ha in Malti, so it's pronounced like a normal, like a ha. Whereas what they write as an H without that stroke um, is silent. So yeah, I think this letter is called Ha in Maltese. Then we have the voiced counterpart of this, which is represented in Arabic by the letter Ain, and also Hebrew Ain, Syriac Ai, Giz A, and Maltese. I think uh, this letter combination in Maltese is seen as a single letter and is called Ain. So you don't really hear the pharyngeal sound in Maltese. It's just like the, the vowel is lengthened, ein. But in the other languages, when it is preserved, or if, um, then it is pronounced like a, like the a in Ali or Muammar in Arabic. Also the, the name of the language, Arabi, Al-Arabiya. Or also the, the ancient name of Hebrew, Ibrith, or Ivrith. Okay, with the ein, Ivrith. Okay, so these are pharyngeal consonants. Then also most Semitic languages have something called emphatic consonants. Emphatic consonants can sound quite differently. There's basically two methods how these sounds are pronounced. In some languages, these are glottalized or ejective, which means, for example, the first one is pronounced tz in some languages. Okay, tz. In other languages, these sounds are pronounced pharyngealized, which means while you pronounce like an, an S or a D, the throat is also constricted at the same time. So you have something like sa, sa. We mostly find the, um, the first way of pronouncing them, the, the glottalized way. We found that in Ethiosemitic and in modern South Arabian, at least in certain variants, not in all of them. And we probably had this kind of pronunciation also in Akkadian and maybe also in Northwest Semitic up to some certain point in history and probably in Proto-Semitic. And the uh, pharyngealized pronunciation, we have that in modern Aramaic and Arabic, uh, Masoretic Hebrew pronounced it like this. We have sources for that. Um, yeah, I think that's most of it. So for example, emphatic S. In Arabic, we have the letter Saad to represent it. In Hebrew, well, modern Hebrew says Tzadi, but uh, in Masoretic Hebrew, it was Saadi. Okay, also some kind of constricted S, Saadi. Uh, Syriac, Saadi, and Giz, Ta. Okay, so Giz, as an Ethiosemitic language, has the uh, glottalized or ejective pronunciation, Ta. 
as in Salot, which means prayer, which is Salat in Arabic and Slotho in Syriac, but Salot in Giz. Then we have this sound, which is quite rare, rare in Semitic, because in many languages it has merged with other sounds, like in in uh, Hebrew it just became uh, Tzadi or Sadi. But this sound is preserved in Arabic as Da, Da, so an emphatic D, Da, or Dad, the letter name, Dad. And actually in ancient Semitic languages, um, or let's say in Proto-Semitic, uh, this was a lateral sound. So lateral means it was pronounced with the sides of the tongue, similar to an L, just like this is not an L, this was some kind of glottalized and pharyngealized, depending on the language, a fricative sound. So I, I could explain this in, in several ways uh, using phonetic terminology, but basically um, the most, probably most conservative pronunciation of this would be uh, and it is actually still pronounced like this in some modern South Arabian languages. Uh, some also uh, pharyngealize it like sha, sha or ja. And there is also um, very strong evidence that 8th century Arabic still pronounced it similar to this. We can look at this in my Arabic video and we'll study the, the descriptions in Al-Kitab written by the grammarian Siba Wai in the 8th century. And probably also this Giz letter was pronounced like that in ancient times. So today in most church traditions it is pronounced like Tz, just like the one before, but in ancient times we have also evidence that this was pronounced uh, okay uh, so the word for sun in Giz was hi okay even though today in modern liturgical pronunciation you would say it's a high like it's it's a high the name of the letter in Amharic it's it's a high but in ancient times a high okay then we have an emphatic T um, Arabic would be ta Hebrew ancient Hebrew faith Syriac, te, or I think they, they say teith also as the letter name teith, and giz, te, okay, glottalized, te. Then we have an emphatic interdental, which means in proto-Semitic, this is probably something like te, te, and I think you would still find this kind of pronunciation in some varieties of modern South Arabian. Uh, uh, in Arabic, this is the letter the. Okay, so it became voiced and pharyngealized, simply the. And also we have an emphatic K, which is sometimes trans transcribed with a Q or with a K with a dot below. So in Arabic we have Qaf, Hebrew Qof, Syriac Qop, and in Giz we have K, okay, glottalized or ejective K. And in Maltese, they use the letter Q, but they pronounce it like in Arabic terms you would say Hamza, which is also done in many Arabic dialects, or in Hebrew terms you would say Aleph. So, for example, I remember in Malta there was one bus station, I think, which was written Q-R-O-Q-Q, -Q -Q, and it was pronounced something like Ro. Okay, so not Krok, but Ro, like a, just a glottal stop. So these are emphatic consonants. Okay, and also, um, Semitic has a tripartite vowel system, which means three vowels, A, E, U, with long variants, A, E, U, and you still find this in Arabic. In other languages, sorry, in other languages, this has changed a bit. Uh, many Semitic languages have um, shifted some of, these con uh, some of these vowels to other vowels and lost the length distinction, which is what we have in Giz. So uh, short A became E, and long A became simply A. Short E and U merged into a single vowel. Diphthongs I and O became E and O, like in Hebrew and some Arabic dialects as well, and Aramaic. And yeah, but, but still, all the Giz vowels can be traced back to this tripartite vowel system. The same can be done in Hebrew, even though in Hebrew the situation looks a bit more difficult, but um, there are certain rules as for how these original three vowels changed into what we have in, in Hebrew in the uh, Tiberian punctuation system. So if you know the rules, you can actually reconstruct a Hebrew text back into a form with a tripartite vowel system. 
If we talk about morphology, the way words are formed, all Semitic languages have a system called root and pattern morphology, which means we have a root. A root is always, uh, always consists of only of consonants. Most roots have three consonants. A few have two. There's also a few roots who have four or even five consonants, mostly in, in southern Semitic languages. But most of the roots are simply three consonants, like the root S, L, M, which means safety or peace. And we can form a lot of different words, verbs, uh, nouns, adjectives, adverbs, etc., based on this root. For example, the verb Salim, he was safe, and the present tense Yaslam, he is safe. But with a doubled L, Salam, he preserved, Yusallam, he preserves. And if we take Salam and change the vowels, we can turn it into a passive. Sullam, he was preserved, Yusallam, he is being preserved. We can also use a long A, Salam, he kept the peace, Yusallam, he keeps the peace. Okay? And we can use this structure to make it causative. Aslam, he committed himself. Yuslam, he commits himself. And we can also form nouns and adjectives like salam, peace, salim, safe. And this one is quite famous, Islam, which means reconciliation to God's will. Okay, and there's many more verb forms, uh, adjectives and nouns we can construct based on this root and the different patterns. And this doesn't only work in Arabic, but of course also in other Semitic languages. And we can have a look at the exact same root in Hebrew. So in Hebrew, the root is a little different. Instead of S, we have this sh sound, which is called sheen in Hebrew. So sha, la, ma is also safety, peace. And then we have like this verb, sholem, he was safe. Yishlam, he is safe. Shillim, he reimbursed. Yeshallim, he reimburses. Shullam, it was repaid. Yeshullam, it is being repaid. Hishlim, he performed. Yashlim, he performs. Shalom is a noun meaning peace. Shalim, an adjective, safe. Shilluma, retribution. And Shalem, peace offering. By the way, if you have questions on these and transliteration symbols for Hebrew and why I use them and why I pronounce Hebrew and of course the other Semitic languages the way I pronounce them, I will talk about that in detail in the videos dealing with individual Semitic languages. So you want to know why I say Shalem and not Shalem like in modern Hebrew, just wait for my Hebrew video. So another aspect, very basic aspect of morphology that you can always use for comparison is personal pronouns. So if we look at these pronouns, first common singular, which means I, second masculine singular, you, but talking to a man, second feminine singular, you, but talking to a woman, uh, 3ms means he, 3fs means she, uh, you can see that they are more or less the same in all Semitic languages. So like I, in Arabic, we have Anna. Hebrew, Anochi or Ani, Ge is Anne. Kheri is, well, modern South Arabian is kind of a freak, which is why I included it here as well. It is He, which is quite mysterious. Um, how did Anna become He, or how did Anochi or Akkadian Anaku become He? We don't really know. There's some, some suggestions. Um, I can talk about this and that in detail later. Yeah, and, and you see, of course, Akkadian Anaku is quite similar to Hebrew Anochi. Uh, what is you? Masculine, Anta, Ato, Ante, Het, Atta. You, feminine, Anti, At, Anti, Hit, Ati. He is Hua, Hu, Wetu, Sheh, Shu. Or actually, I believe it, or I think it's consensus in Akkadian, this S. Um, the sibilant sound, which is transcribed as like a sheen, and as with the hachik above, was probably pronounced like a normal S in Old Babylonian, so su. And she, that is heya, he, yeiti, se, si. And especially the heri part, a modern South Arabian part, is interesting because this seems to be the proto-Semitic form with two different S sounds. So he had a sh sound and she had a s sound, she and se. 
I will talk about these form in Proto-Semitic later, near the end of this video. But you can see um, these are basically almost the same, all of them. There's also dual forms in some languages, so forms uh, referring to two persons, and we don't have them in Giz or Hebrew or Akkadian. In Arabic, we don't have a word for the two of us, but we have Antuma, which is the two of you, and Huma, the two of them. Okay, and interestingly in Kheri, we've also got a word for the two of us, which is identical to the word for the two of you. So in Kheri, we have T, T, and she. And the plural, well, of course, there we have the full range of the full range of um, pronouns. So Arabic has Nahnu, Antum, Antunna, Hum, Hunna. Antum and Hum can become Antumu and Humu under certain uh, circumstances. In Hebrew, we have Anahnu or Nahnu, Atem, Atena or Aten. Hema or Hem and Hena. In Giz we have Nehne and Timmu and Tin, Witomu or Imuntu and Witon or Imantu. In Shari we have Naha or Nhan, Tum, Ten, Shum, Sin. And in Akkadian Old Babylonian we have Ninu, Atunu, Atina, Sunu, Sina. And we can see even here. Even Shari is quite regular if you look at well, basically all of the forms. Tum as compared to Antum, Ten compared to Antunna, Shum and Sin compared to Hum and Hunna. The only difference that we see here is that Shari and Akkadian have S sounds in these third person pronouns, also in the singular, whereas other Semitic languages like Arabic and Hebrew and also Aramaic have H sounds. Some Semitic languages also replace the H sounds with like a Hamza-like sounds with the glottal stop. In uh, Giz it kind of disappeared and there's a set of new pronouns that also appeared. But um, this is one of the main phonological differences between the more conservative Semitic languages like Akkadian and modern South Arabian, they still have S sounds in these pronouns and also in certain verb forms, whereas the more progressive Semitic languages like Arabic and Northwest Semitic have these H sounds. So we can also look at nominal inflection. Here we have the word for dog. And in Arabic, dog in the singular, so a dog, has three different endings for nominative, accusative, and genitive. So let me use, use the laser pointer. We have Kalbun, Kalban, Kalbin. We also have a dual form, which means two dogs, Kalbani and Kalbani. And we have a plural. Arabic is among the Semitic languages that have so-called broken plurals or derivational plurals. Uh, so a dog doesn't get a plural ending, but an internal change of the vowel pattern. Instead of Kalb, we say Kilab and just add the same endings like the singular. So. Kilabun, kilaben, kilaben. Then, of course, we also have a form for feminine, for female dogs or bitches, kalbatun, kalbatan, kalbatan. And two of them are kalbatani, kalbataini, and the plural, so uh, female dogs, more of them, kalbatun, kalbatan. And there's one thing that is very important. We see that feminine forms are also formed with a T. And this applies to all Semitic languages and also languages in all branches of Afroasiatic, of which Semitic is a branch. So we will have a look at that in my next video on Afroasiatic, but you will see this female T will reoccur again and again and again. But in this video, we look at Semitic languages, so let's look at another Semitic language. Akkadian, Old Babylonian, to be more precise, um, looks quite similar to Arabic, but the, uh, for example, the um, um, im, Arabic has un, an, in with an n, Akkadian has an m. So also in Akkadian, a dog, we have kalbum, kalbum, kalbum. Akkadian also has duals, but I put them in brackets here because in Akkadian, duals are only used for body parts that appear in pairs, 
like hands, ears, eyes, etc. So theoretically, we could say Kalban and Kalbin in Akkadian for two dogs, but in reality, they would also say they would also use the plural, which is uh, Kalbu and Kalbi for two dogs. Okay, so hence the dual form is in brackets here. And also the feminine, you see the T again. Kalbatum, Kalbatam, Kalbatim, Kalbatan, Kalbatin, Kalbatum, Kalbatim. Very similar to Arabic, indeed. Two conservative Semitic languages. If we look at Hebrew, first of all, we don't have cases. Okay, we don't have uh, different endings for the accusative and genitive, and also these um and un endings have uh, were just dropped. So in Hebrew, we just have the <clears throat> the, the noun for dog, kelev, without an ending. Um, theoretically, also in Hebrew, you could form a dual form, kalbayim, but in reality, in Hebrew, also you only find the dual with things that that appear in pairs, mostly body parts, ears, eyes, etc. And then we have the uh, the plural kelavim, which um, the the core of it has a slightly different form than uh, than the singular, but still has a plural ending im. This is a plural ending, and we had plural endings in Akkadian, but not in Arabic. The feminine form uh, normally it's kalba, and in the construct state, so when it appears before a different noun and you say um, the female dog of something, then it's kalbath. And there we see the feminine T again. The dual, uh, I don't know if there are any dual forms of feminine nouns with a with an F ending in Hebrew at all, but there's a plural, which is kalavoth. So the same form like the uh, masculine plural, but with a different ending, oath. And this oath, of course, goes back to Arabic and Akkadian at. So kalif, Kalbayim, Kalavim, Kalba or Kalbath and Kalavoth. So one other thing we could have a look at is syntax, so the way sentences are arranged and Semitic languages are originally VSO languages. See it here, VSO, which means verb, subject, object. So the verb is usually in old Semitic languages at the beginning of the sentence. Not like English. English is an SVO language, subject, verb, object, like um, John plays baseball, okay, subject, verb, object. But Semitic languages were originally VSO languages. Many of the old ones still uh, are. Uh, modern Semitic languages often have tendencies to also follow uh, an SVO pattern, which seems to be much more common around the world and seems to be less marked or a more natural way of speaking. But here we have four examples of old Semitic languages. So if we look at Arabic, um, all are the same sentences. So what I've translated here in four different languages is uh, the dog ate a bone. So in Arabic we have akala, the verb, ate, then al kalbu, the dog, and then hazman, a bone. Okay, so literally ate the dog a bone. So Arabic, classical Arabic usually starts with a verb, akala al kalbu hazman. The dog ate a bone. If we look at this in classical Hebrew, it's the exact same thing. Ochal hakelev aisem. Ochal hakelev aisem. Ate the dog a bone. Okay. In Ge'ez, the same, only that they use a different verb for eat. In Ge'ez, to eat is bera, which means to swallow in other Semitic languages, but in Ge'ez it means to eat. So bela kelp atzma. Bela kelp atzme. Same word order. Ate the dog a bone. Now Akkadian, we you probably would expect the same thing in Akkadian because it's old and conservative, but Akkadian is actually quite divergent from other Semitic languages in many many respects. And that is partly due to the influence of Sumerian. So Akkadian was spoken in ancient Mesopotamia together with the, with the uh, Sumerian language language and the both of them have influenced each other and there's a lot of influence of Sumerian and Akkadian including the word order and this led to Akkadian having an SOV word order which means the verb is usually at the end of the sentence so subject object verb which is why in Akkadian we still have the same 
words like Al Kalbu or Hakkelev or Kelb is Kalbum in Akkadian and uh, Bone Adman Asem Atzme and in Akkadian we have Etzemtam and the verb is also the same as in Arabic and Hebrew so Akala or Khal and Ichul but it is at the end so we say Kalbum Etzemtam Ichul in Akkadian Kalbum Etzemtam Ichul so literally the dog a bone ate okay the dog a bone ate whereas in West Semitic languages we would say ate the dog a bone so this is one uh, important aspect of Semitic syntax another aspect is that um, Semitic languages very often have nominal sentences without verbs so if I want to say something like the king is my master the king is my master. In most European languages, we need to say something like is, like in English, the king is my master. In Arabic, it is, or in Semitic, sorry, in Semitic, it is very normal to form nominal sentences without verbs. So you would literally just say the king, my master. And it is clear what is being said, though, so they, they don't need a copula like is. So in Arabic, we have al maliku ba'li, the king. And Bali is my master, so master my actually. Bali. Baal is master and E is mine. Okay? Al Maliku Bali. Hebrew. Hamelech Bali. Geiz. Nagush. Okay, we have a different word for king. We don't have Malik, we have Nagush. Nagush Baali. Though there is a tendency in Geiz to insert the word for he. As a copula here. So, Nagush wi'etu ba'aliyya. It can also occur at the end. So, you could also say Nagush ba'aliyya wi'etu. And this is actually, as far as I know, this is also done in modern Hebrew. Like you would say, Hamelech, Hamelech hu ba'ali in modern Hebrew. Correct me if I'm wrong, I don't speak modern Hebrew, but I think you would use hu uh, the same way in modern Hebrew. So, Giz. At the point where we can observe it in its written form seems to be in the process of undergoing a grammatical change where a personal pronoun is used as a copula. But in Akkadian we have the uh, the verbless nominal sentence Malkum Bili. Okay, again, the king, my lord or my master. Malkum Bili. Okay, that is one important of one important aspect of Semitic syntax. Now, if we look at lexicon, um, if we want to compare lexicon, of course, we need to compare the most basic forms of lexicon. If you want to um, look up basic words, what part of lexicon is basic or what part of lexicon is is a rather immune to borrowing, um, you could look up the, uh, the Swadesh list or the Leipzig Jakarta list. Um, those are lists created by linguists. That, are contain, that contain vocabulary that is supposed to be a very, very solid and is often not borrowed and very basic. So those lists contain things like uh, body parts, kinship terms, um, natural phenomena like rain, sun, wind, etc. Um, very basic uh, plants and animal vocabulary, just not too specific. So uh, you won't find words like... Um, like uh, let's say uh, like dung beetle there because it's too specific but um, maybe words like like dog or worm or things like that okay body parts and yeah and also numbers from 1 to 10 are considered part of basic lexicon and are included in the uh, Swadesh and Leipzig Jakarta list so if we look at we could of course look at all kinds of basic lexicon but I want to keep it short here and I just want to look at numerals or numbers from 1 to 10. And so we can look at this in Arabic, Hebrew, Syriac, and Giz, representing different branches of Semitic. So 1 to 5, these are the, the masculine forms of the numbers. And in Arabic, we have wahidun, ithnani, thalathun, arba'un, khamsun. Whereas in Hebrew, we have had shanayim, sholosh, arba, homish. Okay? In Syriac, we have or if I use the Western pronunciation of Syriac, 
Okay, slightly different pronunciation. And in Giz, we have Ahadu, Kil E, Kil E2. So Kil E, Kil E2, both are possible. Thalas, Arba, Khamis. Okay, and you see a lot of similarities, some differences. For example, um, in Syriac, we have an R, whereas the others, Hebrew and Arabic, have an N. But this is this is quite regular because also in Syriac, the word for for the son, so for the for the male offspring, is uh, is bar, or in, in Aramaic in general, bar, like the bar mitzvah. Whereas in other Semitic languages, we have ben or bin. Okay, so in R N correspondence, and there's a lot of other things to point out like. Arabic has th, this interdental in uh, several numerals, whereas Hebrew has shifted these sounds in general, not just numbers, to sh, which is why ithnani is shnayim and thalathun is shalosh. And in Syriac, these sounds, this th sound has become t, but after vowels, again, it becomes th. That's why we have train and cloth. Okay, so we can observe. Um, a lot of very regular sound um, sound correspondences between Semitic languages here. And yeah, just one thing that is a little more irregular is the G is word for two, kil e or kil e tu, but this is actually cognate with the West Semitic word for um, for both. I think it's kilat in Arabic or something like that. Okay, and the rest, I mean, it is pretty striking how, how similar they are. So. Let's do thick, let's do, sorry, not thick, but six, six to ten. Oh, sorry, yeah, one thing I wanted to point out, of course, numbers also have feminine forms, and you see again, the feminine forms are marked with a T, which doesn't always occur. So, for example, in Hebrew um, and also in Syriac, sometimes instead of the T, we only have an all vowel ending, but I mean, it's the same with nouns. But apart from that, also in giz, we have a lot of T endings. All the numbers get a T ending for the feminine. Arabic as well, and this actually happens in a lot of other Afro-Asiatic languages as well. But now let's just go on with 6 to 10. So Arabic is situn, sab'un, thamanin, tis'un, ashrun. Hebrew has Shish, Sheva, Shemone, Tesha, and Eser. Syriac has Sheth, Shwa, Tmone, Tsha, Asar. And Giz has Sisu, Sebu, Semani, Tisu, or Tesu, and Ashru. Okay, again, these are basically the, the same numbers, the same words, just with different sound laws applied. With different sound changes and the uh, feminine forms as well you will see the t's and in hebrew and syriac the r endings which go back to t endings and if we just look at a couple of other semitic languages just to see how different they can actually be so in khairi we have tad thro halith orba and khish and apart from one, this seems quite quite regular, just with a couple of different sound changes. The word for tad is interesting. We only have it in modern South Arabian, and it is also attested in in one ancient South Arabian language, maybe Katabanic. So in Katabanic, we have tad besides Another word for one, Ishtan, which seems also odd if you don't know Akkadian, because Akkadian also has Istain. And this is probably the, the actual proto-Semitic word for one, whereas this Ahad that we also had in, in all the other languages, Arabic, Hebrew, etc., probably meant something like lonely in proto-Semitic. Okay? And the other ones, I mean, the Harari ones are pretty similar to, to um, Aramaic, uh, sorry, to Amharic, like Koot or Kot for two, and Shishti or Shishti for three. So if you know Amharic, you will recognize them as uh, Hulet and Sost. And then we have Harat and Hamisti in Harari. And the other ones, all of them should be pretty regular. So let me just read them to you. So in Harari, you have 
Ahad, Ka'at or Ka'at, Shi'ishti or Shi'ishti, Harat and Hamisti. In Katabanic, for one you have Ta'at or Ishtan or Ahad. Thinau, Thalath, Arba, Khamsh. And in Akkadian you have Istain, Sina, Salas, Erbe, Khamis. Okay, so numerals. Now, as for the internal classification, there have been a lot of different uh, suggestions on how to determine or how to how to subgroup Semitic languages. So let me just quickly go over some of the uh, some of the accepted or some of the well-known internal classification uh, attempts. So the most traditional one, going back to Semiticists like uh, Theodor Nöldecke or Karl Brockelmann, basically divides Semitic into three branches: East Semitic mostly consisting of Akkadian, Northwest Semitic, mostly consisting of Canaanite and Aramaic, and South Semitic, consisting of Arabic, Ethiopic, Old South Arabian, and Modern South Arabian. Okay, and of course, uh, these Old Semiticists had some certain features in mind that can be used to determine the relationship between these languages or justify this kind of subgrouping. So for example, what is Northwest Semitic? One of the main features is the shift from wow to ya in certain words, like the word for to give birth. In Hebrew, you have yalad and in Aramaic, yalad, but for example, in Arabic, you have walada with a wow. Okay, so this wow to ya shift is one feature that defines Northwest Semitic. Some features of South Semitic, which means Arabic, Ethiopic, etc., is the L stem, so a verb stem with a long vowel, and the first syllable like Arabic qatala or ge'ez qatala. Okay, broken plurals are also seem of one of the main or defining features of um, South Semitic. So for example, dog and dogs. In Arabic, you have kalb and kilab. In ge'ez, you have kelb, and the plural form can be aklab, aklipt, or akalipt. But, for example, in Hebrew, you have kelev and kelavim, even though the vowel pattern is slightly different, but there's only, actually, there's only this, this one special plural vowel pattern in Hebrew. Even though the vowel pattern in the plural is different, Hebrew still adds the, the, the regular plural ending. Im, kelev, kelavim. And in Aramaic, it's even more regular. You have kelev, kalbin. And in Akkadian, for example, I don't have it on the slide now, but you've seen it a couple of slides before. In Akkadian, you have uh, Kalb and Kalbu. Okay, so actually no real internal change, but adding a plural ending. Whereas Arabic and Ge'ez and also um, Epigraphic South Arabian and Modern South Arabian have special patterns for plurals. And East Semitic features, what are East Semitic features? What I noted here, just look at Akkadian. Akkadian is the... Um, most prominent uh, East Semitic language, and it differs from, from the other Semitic languages in so many respects, partly due to uh, Sumerian influence. So yeah, Akkadian just f differs in so many respects from the other Semitic languages that I didn't want to uh, make a full list here. So uh, at some point there has been a rev revised internal classification by Robert Hetzron who basically divides Semitic into East Semitic and West Semitic. And then West Semitic in turn uh, contains things like Northwest Semitic, which is grouped together with Arabic into a so-called Central Semitic subgroup. And then we have South Semitic containing Ethiopic and modern South Arabian. Now you see Arabic is not grouped with South Semitic anymore. Those groups have been redefined and you will see why. So the main argument for, sorry, 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 this is wrong. So of course this is the the revised Hetzron model. So the main feature of Semitic languages justifying this internal classification is the verbal system. In East Semitic we have the so-called Old Semitic verbal system, which has two forms. Two forms of the verb where the subject is marked with a prefix. And basically the difference is one form has gemination, so the second consonant is doubled. 
Okay, what does this look like practically? So, for example, in Akkadian, we have Iprus and Iparras. These are the two main forms of the verb. So, Iprus, or actually it was pronounced probably like Iprus. So, Iprus means um, he divided, which is the, uh, the perfect tense, he divided, and Iparras means he divides or he will divide so this is the imperfect tense okay perfect imperfect both with a prefix to mark the the person iprots and then you have different prefixes for the persons like taprots which means uh, you divided or aprots i divided niprots we divided but there's basically these two tenses okay and the difference is the doubling of the second consonant here you see the single r and here the double r then there's West Semitic, which has the late Semitic verbal system with two subtypes. One is late Semitic 1, which we found, find in South Semitic, that is Ethio Semitic and modern South Arabian. And there we have three verb forms or three tenses. Okay. Again, we have one with the uh, double second consonant, which the first form hasn't. Both have prefixes to mark the person, and then we have a new suffix conjugation verb form. So it does not have prefixes to mark the person, but suffixes. A primitive form of this existed in Akkadian, but was very limited, uh, called the stative in Akkadian. But in late Semitic 1, or South Semitic, or Ethio Semitic in modern South Arabian, we basically got these three verb forms. So, for example, in Giz, we have uh, three forms of the verb, yuktil, yuketil, and ketele. So, yuktil is a subjunctive form, like liyuktil, that he kill. And yuketil is just the imperfect, so he kills or he will kill, yuketil. And ketele is now the new form for the past tense, or for the perfect, he killed. Okay, yuktil, yuketil, ketele. So these two are inherited, and this one is new. Kind of inherited from the Akkadian stative, but the Akkadian stative, as I said, is very limited in use and is not really the same thing. So this is the uh, late Semitic 1 verb system, and then we have late Semitic 2. Late Semitic 2 basically just deleted this form and inherited this one. And this one. So, for example, in Arabic, we have yaktul and qatala. This is the uh, imperfect and this is the perfect. So, yaktul, he kills or he will kill, and qatala, he killed. Okay? And, yeah, so this is basically the main argument why we um, distinguish between East and West Semitic, and then West Semitic is, in turn, um, subclassified into South and Central Semitic. But even this model has been revised and and there have been new models over time. So there's one other example that I want to show here for an internal classification where, uh, for example, we see uh, South Semitic being divergent from all other groups of Semitic and in this model South Semitic only consists of modern South Arabian because there's many respects uh, in which modern South Arabian is quite distinct from other Semitic languages. The question is always um, what features of the uh, Semitic languages, uh, what features do we deem more important for classification? Because there's also features in which um, Akkadian differs more from the other Semitic languages than modern South Arabian. So what is more important? Is it the verbal system? Is it the syntax? Is it some other aspect of morphology? So uh, what do we define as the, the distinguishing feature? And as long as we have different ideas on how to do that, we'll have different um, models for the internal classification of the Semitic languages. Okay, I will give you a couple of seconds just to look at this and enjoy this pedigree and then I will go on with the next slide. So, 
Um, concerning these uh, classification models, I just want to want you to know one thing or keep one thing in mind. So um, the problem with linguistic tree models is, first of all, that languages can be in contact. Doesn't matter whether these languages are genetically related or not, but languages can be in contact, which means that these languages will borrow features among each other. Um, yeah, and so the, the tree model only gives an incomplete picture of relationship uh, because um, these borrowings or these uh, effects of language contact can kind of um, make the, the picture of a family tree that we have, um, it, it can blur the picture of relationship and basically um, language contact is also a form of language relationship. Okay, so these family trees of language families only show a part of the truth and give us an incomplete picture of the of the actual relationship and similarities and differences between those languages. You might want to look up words like wave model, Sprachbund or aerial features to learn more about this. So now let's come to reconstruction, proto-Semitic and its Urheimat. If we compare all languages of a family, doesn't matter what language family we talk about, this allows us to reconstruct a proto-language, which is a hypothetical ancient language that is the ancestor of all languages of a certain language family. So if we compare all Semitic languages, we can construct this so-called proto-Semitic language which means this was one language spoken at some point, and at some point this proto-Semitic language, hypothetically that it is, began to spread and become more diverse, split up into dialects and then into languages, and then finally into the many Semitic languages that we have today. So one, just one simple example of how we can do that. Just let's look at the word for thousand in Semitic languages. So in Arabic we have alfun. In Hebrew we have alef. It's pretty much the same, just lacks this un ending of Arabic, but pretty much the same thing. The vowels are a little different, but there's um, rules for that. This is a, a segulate noun. Okay, so Arabic alfun, Hebrew alef. Ugaritic, well, we don't have vowels in Ugaritic, but we can reconstruct this as alpu. And just like Imperial Aramaic, the same thing. Alp, probably without um, case endings. Then in Giz, for thousand we have Asher Tumit, which means ten hundred. But in Giz, for ten thousand, we have the word Ilf, which is without doubt the same thing. So at some point it probably meant thousand. In Sabaic, again, we have no vowels, but can kind of reconstruct them. Alfum. In Akkadian we have Lim, which is completely different because Akkadian borrowed this from a totally different non-Semitic language, Sumerian. But based on all the data we have, we can infer that at some point all of these words went back to a single form, probably something like Alpum. So we can reconstruct the word Alpum for a thousand in Proto-Semitic. That's basically how it works. So this example was a single word, but this works also for grammatical endings, uh, sentence patterns, sounds, so phonemes, morphemes, etc., etc., and then finally the whole language. But there's one general problem with proto languages that I want to mention: features can disappear without a trace when languages change. So for a moment, just imagine we wouldn't know Latin. For whatever reason, it was never written down or other written evidence is lost in history. We don't know Latin. So um, we could try to reconstruct a protoform of modern Romance languages. And for example, if we look at the word for friend in three Romance languages. So in Italian, we have amico. In Spanish, we have amigo. And in French, we have ami. So based on the data we have, we can kind of reconstruct a proto-Romance, which would be Latin word for friend, 
and our result would probably be something like the Italian form amico. However, in reality, we do know Latin and we know that Latin has an us ending here, amicus. But this ending, as far as I know, didn't survive in any modern Roman's language. Um, and at least in the three examples I have here, amico, amigo, and ami, the s didn't survive. So based on the data we have, we cannot reconstruct it. Um, it is just lost in time. In reality, it isn't because we know Latin. But if we didn't know Latin, um, this ending would just be lost without any trace. And this is just an ending. What about whole words? I mean, we know that in classical Latin, the word for yellow was flavus or flavus. Whereas in Italian, we say giallo. In Spanish, we say amarillo. And in French, we say jaune. So just based on the data, there's no way we would be able to reconstruct this completely different word flowers, which, as far as I know, did not survive into any modern Roman's language. So the reality is um, it was replaced by other words. Uh, Italian giallo goes back to to the old French form of jaune. I don't know what it was in old French, but basically jaune and giallo originally go back to a Latin word meaning yellowish greenish. In Spanish, completely different word, amarillo. I think it goes back to word for sour because uh, because lemons are sour and also yellow, so there's a um, there's a reason to to change the meaning like that. But the word flavus didn't survive, and based on the data we have here, it is impossible to reconstruct. Okay, so this is something to keep in mind. Proto languages are just models and are just approximations. Proto languages are very unlikely to ever be precise because there's always features like sounds words, endings, sentence patterns that are lost without a trace forever. Okay, keep this in mind when I go to the next step, which is actually reconstructing some proto-Semitic and reading it to you, which will then conclude this video. So just a couple of more minutes. So just one remark on proto-Semitic and its Urheimat. Theories on the Urheimat, which means ancestral homeland, include the Levant, Mesopotamia, Arabia, Horn of Africa, and the Sahara. So the Semitic, proto-Semitic language, the origin of all later Semitic languages, might have been in one of those areas. Though Arabia is now deemed unlikely because the climate of Arabia doesn't really support a mass, a mass um, immigration. Uh, the Sahara is an interesting theory. It has to do with the fact that uh, the Sahara was green and lush at some point. Um, yeah, very different theories. I think the Levant is the most popular one, but they all have their supporters. And it was spoken until around maybe 4000 BC, and then it started diversing. The problem is, again, one other general problem with, with proto-languages. It was spoken until around 4000 BC, BCE for several millennia. So the point at which Proto-Semitic diverged from Proto-Afro-Asiatic was several, maybe four millennia before this. And <coughs> I mean, you, you can imagine how much a language changed within four millennia. So Proto-Semitic in uh, 9000 BCE was very, must have been very, very different from Proto-Semitic um, in 4000 BCE. So keep that in mind when we talk about proto-languages. Usually what we reconstruct is the the latest point before it started diverging into several languages. So if we reconstruct proto-Semitic, what we try to reconstruct it is, is like the, the proto-Semitic spoken around 4000 BCE, not 8000 BCE. That would be in theory much closer to proto-Afro-Asiatic. So just some remarks on proto-Semitic phonology and how it differs from modern Semitic languages. Um, yeah, let me just read these sounds to you and maybe then give you a couple of um, extra comments. So it had two glottal consonants, uh, like the Arabic Hamza or Hebrew Aleph and ha, huh? two pharyngeals, a ah, and ha, huh. a couple of velar consonants, g, k, k, g, h, w. And a pedal consonant, y. Yeah. And then a number of alveolar sounds like n, d, t, 
Zeta. Then we have the Proto-Semitic Z or Zai, which was maybe more like Z, like an affricate. Z. Then we have, well, in Hebrew, this is Sheen, in Arabic, Sin. Uh, it is sometimes also transliterated as S1. And the pronunciation was probably just S in Proto-Semitic. So in Arabic, we have Salam, Hebrew, Shalom, Aramaic, Shlama, and probably in Proto-Semitic, it was Salamum. Then we have this S2, which became Sheen in Arabic, but Sin in Hebrew. And it was probably pronounced sh, so a lateral alveolar sibilant sh, with the sides of the tongue. Then we have S3, which was probably tz. Then we have some emphatics tz, tz, and we have r and l. Some dental sounds, which means the, th, and th, and three labial sounds m, b and p. Okay, this is the uh, consonant inventory of Proto-Semitic plus three vowels, a, e, u, with long variants, a, e, u. So some pronouns, let's look at some pronouns, all reconstructed. So, anaku, let me point at it, anaku, anta, anti, sua, zia, antuma, suma, nehnu, Antumu, Antina, Sumu, Zina. And here I used a more phonetic transcription. Actually, um, in the normal transliteration system, here and here we would use the S with hard check, like, like Sheen or S1. And this would be S3 or the plain S, but I try to make it a little more phonetic. Okay? Anaku, Anta, Anti, Su, Atzia, Antuma, Suma. Nehnu antumu antina sumu zina. And some, because we talked about before, some nominal morphology, the word for dog again, kalbum, kalbam, kalbim, kalbana, kalbaina, and plurals are really hard because uh, broken plurals, like the Arabic type, are might have been proto Semitic, but it is impossible to reconstruct actual broken plural forms because they are so different between Arabic and Ethiosemitic and modern South Arabian. So it's very hard to determine whether or, or what exactly like the, the plural pattern for Kalb looked like in Proto-Semitic. And they might have been very simple, uh, similar to what you have in Hebrew with the just the short A in the second syllable. And maybe they also added uh, plural endings. So this is a very complicated topic and without guarantees I reconstructed kalabuna and kalabina. So singular kalbum but plural kalabuna with an a here. Okay, feminine is easier. Kalbatum, kalbatam, kalbatim, kalbatana, kalbataina, kalbatum, kalbatim. Okay, this is what a uh, noun uh, inflection for for the word for dog might have been like in Proto-Semitic. And numerals, masculine and feminine. Let me count like like the way you count in Semitic languages today, which means for one and two you use the masculine, for the others the feminine. So, astum, thanana, thalathatum, arbaatum, khamisatum, sittatum, sabatum, thamaniatum. Tisatum Asharatum. Okay, those might have been the Proto Semitic numbers from one to ten. And to give you something else, some other basic vocabulary, why not just look at body parts? Hair, Sha'arum, Head, Rasum, Ear, Uthnum, Eye, Ainum, Nose, Anpum. Mouth, payum, tooth, sinnum, tongue, lisanum, fingernail, thoprum, foot or leg, riglum, knee, birkum, hand, yadum, wing, canapum, belly, karthum, guts, miayum, neck, kisadum, back, gunbum, Breast, hadium, 
heart, libum, liver, cabidum, blood, damum. Okay, just to give you an idea, first idea of what the vocab was and what it sounded like. And now finally, a short text in Proto-Semitic. Um, please keep in mind, I'm, I'm not an expert in actual reconstruction. And what I like to do is reconstruct the, the phonology and pronunciation of languages that are actually attested, like Sebaic or Akkadian, but Proto-languages are not my thing. So this attempt might be quite immature, okay? I will read it to you once, the whole thing, and then I read it sentence by sentence and translate it into English. Okay? So, يَحْسَبُ إِلُونَ رَبُّونَ كِي يِلَّأَكُ عِبْلَمْ كِي يِكَأْتَلُ وَنَاسَمْ وَيُسَلْمِدْ إِلُمْ عَثَّرُمْ حَسْبَمْ لِإِنْسِمْ يَرْأَيْ نَبْسَمْ بِبَيْتِ سُو وَيَأْمُرْ عَثَّرُمْ يَرْأَيْ نَبْسَمْ لِيَثَبَّرْ بَيْتَ سُو وَيِبَنَّ يَرَكْبَمْ ثَامِئَةٍ وَعَشَرَيْنَ أَمَّا لِيُسَحِّ حَيِّنَا وَيَبْيُؤُ عَبَدُونَ بِتْسَبَاحِمْ لِيَبَنَّ يُرَكْبَمْ وَسَلِمَ رَكْبُمْ وَيَمْلَأْسُ يَرْأَيْ نَبْسَمْ بِكُلِّ مْثِي حَيِّنَا وَبِتْسَبَاحِمْ يَثْلَمْ سَمَايُمْ وَيُسَمْتِرْ هَدَدُمْ مَتْأَرَمْ رَبَّمْ Okay, now sentence by sentence with translations. And maybe a little slower. First sentence. يَحْسُبُ إِلُونَ رَبُّونَ كي يلاقو ايبلم ليكاتلو اناسم so the gods the the great gods um thought or let's say in, invented a plan um man i'm not sure about the english translation here because of course i'm a native speaker of german and i translated this like from german to proto-semitic so um the great gods came up with a plan to uh, send a, a deluge, a flood, to kill humanity. Maybe like this. Wa yusalmid ilum astarum haspam li insim yer anapsam bibaiti su. So, and uh, the god Astar um, taught or yeah, taught this plan to the to the man Yar Ainapsam or informed the man Yar Ainapsam of this plan in his house. Wa Yamur Astarum Yar Ainapsam Li Yethabar Baitasu Wa Yibanai Rakbam Tha Miatim Wa Hasharaina Amma Li Yusahi Hayina. So and after ordered Yar Ainapsam to destroy his house and build a vessel of um, 120 cubits to save the um, living beings or animals. Wa Yabyu Abaduna beats Abahem Li Yibanna Yu Rakbam. So, and uh, the workers came in the morning to build the vessel. وَالسَّلِمَ رَكْبُمْ وَيَمْلَأْسُ يَرْأَ نَبْسَمْ بِكُلِّمْ فِي حَيِّنَا So, and the vessel was complete, was completed. And يَرْأَ نَبْسَمْ um, filled it with all the living beings, with all the animals. وَبِيْتْ أَبَاحِمْ يَفْلَمْ سَمَايُمْ Wa yusamtir hadadum mataram rabbam. And in the morning, the sky darkened and hadad let it rain a great rain. Okay, sounds a little weird in English. Um, and you know what kind of mythology this, I, I got the idea for this story. It's pretty obvious. And yeah, so this was my, as I said, quite immature attempt, but just to to show what it might have been like <clears throat> to reconstruct and read a short text in Proto-Semitic. So that's it for this video. Coming up next, the next thing I want to do, actually I've also already finished the slides for that for the next video, so it might come in the next couple of days. Uh, the next video is on what you see on this map, Afro-Asiatic languages.
And after that, I will start with individual chapters on single Semitic languages, giving you some introduction to the language that video will be about, those videos. And then, of course, reading. Reading Akkadian, Giz, Classical Arabic, Syriac, etc., etc. And I hope you will enjoy it. So, see you next time.